Today, um, I don't know if you guys saw the news last night, but he took a stand for the people of Oklahoma and filed lawsuits in opposition to the um, fees and the taxes that they passed in the last, during the last week of session, which was goes against our Constitution. Um, and so I asked Gary to come in and just speak very briefly, and I know, look, politician, preacher, and attorneys. Okay? You don't dare give them the floor, because oh, he's got all the <laughs> well, good morning. Good morning. Uh, we did uh, announce yesterday that uh, this coming week we will be filing a lawsuit on behalf of the citizens. As I said in my statement yesterday, I, I uh, as a U.S. attorney, I fought for the citizens of our state uh, and prosecuted the county commissioner uh, scandal, which was the largest scandal in the nation at the time. As a private attorney, I've stood up for the individuals. I've always represented the people, those that have been harmed or injured. And uh, so we're going to stand up for the people in regards to what's happened uh, in the legislature of late. I went over four times and uh, talked to the legislators and that type of thing. And, and one of the things that I thought was very interesting, I never one time saw one of our statewide officials on the floor talking to our legislators, trying to persuade them, you know. so. Uh, it's time that we uh, have someone stand up for the people of Oklahoma, and I, I'm willing to do that. I don't need the job, thankfully, and so, and I'm not looking for a career in politics. I'm looking for one thing, and that's turning things around for our state. That's my only purpose for us. What happened in the last five days of the session is, most of you know, Article 5, thir uh, Section 33, does not allow for tax increases in the last five days of a session. Well, on these particular issues, they attempted to get them passed as taxes during the session, and they couldn't get there. They couldn't get 76 votes that they needed to uh, pass these issues as taxes. So in the last five days, they labeled them uh, fees and exemptions. For example, and I'll run through them very quickly, House Bill 2348 is a tax issue, and it decouples the Oklahoma tax uh, issue with the, from the federal, which means as it is now, as the federal taxes uh, deductions go up, so does Oklahoma's. But this uh, particular bill freezes the Oklahoma uh, tax rate deductions where it is. So it's going to cost those who use the standard uh, deduction program in, return, in your tax returns tons of money. It'll affect a large percentage of the Oklahomans. House Bill 2433 raises, basically, it's the excise tax on the purchase of a vehicle. Not only is that, and they even put tax in, in the title. Uh, <laughs> and then call it a fee. And not only does that uh, cost roughly, we <coughs> estimate, or I didn't, but uh, our, our uh, accounts did, $125 million a year to Oklahoma taxpayers. Can you only imagine what it does to car sales and the economy? And then the third one is House Bill 1449, and uh, they said, well, since those who drive uh, electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles aren't paying gas tax, we got to we got to put a tax on them. Well, they call it a fee, but actually it's a tax. A hundred dollars on electric vehicles and thirty dollars on hybrid vehicles. So that's the bottom line. They're passing taxes the last five days. The Constitution says they can't do that, and we're taking it up and contesting it. And I've hired the lawyer uh, to represent me. Uh, his name is Stan Ward, down at Norman. He is the very guy that uh, filed the action uh, for bill, House Bill 640, which says they can't raise taxes in the last five days, Stan Ward. So he knows this bill inside and out, 
and I've worked with him before. He and I have handled a case or two together, and uh, we're going to take it on for the people of this state. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope that's right. Yes. <laughs> Hang on, I've got a couple of questions. Yes. I have one question. Okay. Oh, there's do we need to start an initiative petition in this state to change the wording of that amendment to revenue enhancing measures and get rid of the word taxes out of that? I, I will discuss that with Mr. Ward and see what he thinks about it. Mr. Yeah. Gary, you didn't mention cigarette taxes. Is that well, the cigarette industry has already filed a lawsuit on a cigarette tax. That's a cessation program. Yeah. It's not a tax. <laughs> a a deterrent from smoking, right? <laughs> and uh, my friend uh, in Oklahoma City, uh, Mr. Fent, is going to, he's already got clients and is going to file an action on the uh, oil industry issues. So uh, all of them will be covered. Thank you very much. Hey, Gary, yeah. well, just real quick, I believe the current uh, me, uh, Constitution says in 640 revenue increasing bills. It doesn't say taxes. Yeah. So it's based on its net result of raising revenue. Right? Well, so what Mr. Burgess said already is the case. I it's my thinking I could be wrong that it says tax. I, I, but you could be right. Yeah. You normally are. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gary. We appreciate you very much. You know, it's it's tough. You know, there, a few years ago, um, Tulsa 912 filed an amicus brief um, when they fought the, um, the when we fought Common Core, and then the uh, the courts took it up. And so it's very expensive, and and it's not something yes, it that is. just the average. <laughs> It's not something that just the average citizen can can necessarily afford to do or has the knowledge of how to do it. And so, Gary, we appreciate you standing up for us. We really do. That's right. By um, the campaign won't be paying for this. And you said the campaign will not be paying for it. It's coming out of your pocket. Is that correct? That's right. Thank you. It wouldn't be legal for the campaign. That's right. <laughs> um, okay, without further ado, I'm going to bring up um, Representative Eric Proctor. Um, Representative Proctor has um, has served Oklahoma for what is it 11 years now so he's on his last his last term um, you know he's a Democrat and so we don't that he's not squirming and that's pretty good but um, uh, Eric has has brought a number of different issues to our attention that are not things that we would typically support that were brought forth by Republican legislators, which allowed for us to go in and defeat it. And I can think right offhand of when they were going to give tax credits to um, contractors to come in and build Section 8 housing. You remember that one? <clears throat> and uh, he made us aware of that. Things that get by, you know, over 2,000 bills are typically filed each year, so there's no way that any one person can really keep up with what's going on. And um, I thought that it would be good for us to get a different perspective, because we're hearing a whole lot of, of, of wiggling by Republicans on what happened, especially during the last week of session. And then we do have questions, We do, we, and we ask some tough questions sometimes, Eric, so I just want you to be prepared for that as well. But um, I just asked, I asked Eric if he would come and speak to us so that we could get uh, the other side of the aisle's perspective on what went down during this legislative session, what, what went right, what went wrong, and what needs to be done. And so please join me in welcoming Eric Proctor. Ron, thank you for inviting me and thank you for having me. And as I look across the room, I see some actually pretty good friends in here, uh, from Rhonda and David and Shelly. Um, and Gary, I don't want to, I don't, definitely don't want to hurt your governor's race, but I don't think I disagreed with any case. <laughs> so, uh, I think you, you're spot on. You got, you got my vote. <laughs> and, uh, thank you for thank you for doing what you're doing with with the, with the lawsuits. And um, Shelly, I don't want to hurt you either, but. There is not a finer person um, that one that I've worked with on the other side of the aisle than than your husband, and I've uh, really enjoyed getting to know you and your friendship. And um, you know, 
your family and my family have been out to dinner together and you've been at my house and held my kids and I think you're you're top notch in my book. So I wish you all the best. Um, hope that doesn't hurt you too much. Uh, but I do want to discuss this last legislative session and then kind of where we go from here and how we uh, begin to rebuild our state and how we begin to make uh, this place a, a place of opportunity so that my kids and your kids and your grandkids don't have to leave the state uh, to find jobs and find opportunity, which I think on both sides of the aisle we should be able to agree on. Um, first of all, how we got to where we were. Um, the leadership in the state legislature, I don't believe, had a plan until the last two or three weeks of session. And if they did have a plan, they sure as heck didn't tell anybody about it. Um, they, they continued to say, we'll release our plan, we'll release our plan, and it never came. Um, and I think that's because, or maybe they did have a plan and that was it, um, to, to, uh, to raise the taxes and fees. For me, it's not a position of politics, it was a position of principle. I firmly, uh, at the core, not of who I am as a politician, but of what my faith teaches me, is that increasing taxes on middle income families and the working poor uh, to fill a budget hole created by cutting taxes for the most wealthy industry in the world is not moral, it's not ethical, it's not just. And that's exactly what we did. The state of Oklahoma is the most generous tax for the oil and gas industry of any state in the country. And we can argue the merits of that one way or the other. But the reality of the situation is, we have a budget at deficit because of that, and because of tax credits that were not that were not addressed, and giveaways and exemptions that were not addressed. And to fill that hole, the plan was to raise taxes on middle-income families and the working poor. And to me, that's not just, not right, not moral. It's something that I could not support. And that is not a political position. That is a faith principle position for me. Um, I could not go home and look myself in the mirror. I could not go sit on a pew at First Baptist on Sunday and be able to have any respect for myself if I did that. Um, it would be contrary to everything I promised when I ran for office, and that's something I could not support. And to me, that's, that's not politics at all. Um, some may say it is, but for me it was not. Um, everything that Mr. Richardson said was correct. Um, the the plans to raise taxes on car sales, make it harder for middle income families to buy a car, uh, taxing the guy that gets off American Airlines when he wants to go buy a pack of cigarettes when he gets off work at a 10 hour day, uh, making it more difficult for families to claim a standard deduction. Uh, that's no longer, but by not tying that to the federal level, if President Trump's plan of increasing the standard deduction would, was to happen, what that means is the, the state plan would not follow the federal plan so that both families wouldn't get that additional benefit. So if President Trump got his way on that, uh, Oklahomans would, would be punished, uh, which definitely isn't conservative. I don't think that's conservative. Uh, I don't think that's what uh, the tenets of the Republican Party uh, would state. Um, further, the, the, overall, the overall lack of leadership um, in that building you know, was, was uh, very, very troubling. It's the worst I've seen. Um, I think there are some there are some good men I serve with, and good women I serve with on the other side of the aisle, that we have uh, firm disagreements on. But I believe they're good people, and uh, my hope is that going forward we'll see a stronger, a stronger standard that comes out of the next the next legislative session and the sessions following. Um, there, there are some there are some troubling elements um, that. The only plan that came forward hurt middle income people. That's the only plans, all the plans that came forward hurt middle income families. And to me, that's, uh, that's distressing. Because something that Democrats and Republicans should be able to agree on is that what makes this country great is a large, and ex a large middle class. Being able to give people the opportunity to reach the American dream and expanding uh, their ability to pro uh, provide for their families and that make sure their kids and grandkids have a better life than, than they have. That's what it's all about for me. That's why I ran for office, is to make the path to the American dream broader, not narrower, uh, to make uh, sure that when I, that's, that's goal one for me, goal two has always been to be able to go home and look myself in the mirror at night. For some days, I've got twin girls, it'll be three in August, and uh, someday they're going to say, Daddy, what you doing when you're in the legislature? And I'm going to have to tell them. And so I don't want to have to lie. So that's a big part of it. 
and I'm not running for office in 2018. I'm termed out. I get to have the title that I've been looking forward to having, which is daddy, uh, more than I've been. And so I'm excited about that. Um, the, the cigarette tax issue, the car tax issue, uh, the standard deduction, the uh, fee increase on uh, electric vehicles, um, I voted against every single one of those. And I do want to talk to you a little bit about the importance of the platform caucus and the House Democratic Caucus. Um, where, while we may not agree on everything, or many things, um, we should be able to agree that when you put a budget together, it should at least be constitutional. So, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, uh, when I have been sworn into office six times, I raise my right hand and put my left hand on the Bible, and I say that I will honor the state of the federal constitution, I meant it. And uh, a lot of people on the other side of the aisle meant it too. And thank God they did, because things would have been a lot worse. A lot more taxes would have been increased on middle income families and working poor, and we'd be in a lot worse situation than we are uh, we are currently. I do want to discuss uh, something from my faith that I think will uh, behoove the state of Oklahoma to follow. Uh, there's a story in the Old Testament about Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is most remembered for rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And guess what? Nehemiah and his tribe didn't do it by themselves, did they? It took all the, all the tribes of Israel that came together. Uh, Manasseh and Reuben and Benjamin, all the tribes came together. And they rebuilt that wall. Why did they do that? Because for the nation of Israel, uh, for, for, the tri for the tribes, uh, all 12 tribes, it was important that those walls were strong and that those walls were rebuilt. And they did it together. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to come together as Republicans and Democrats and independents. We may not always agree how we get there, but we should at least be able to agree on some core tenets. One, the budget should be put together constitutionally, and that we should leave the wood pile higher for the next generation. And if we can't do that, if we can't work at least together to do that, then shame on us. Uh, that's why I ran for office, is to make sure my kids, your kids, and your grandkids uh, don't have to be Californians. To find opportunities. Don't have to move to North Texas. Don't have to move to Northwest Arkansas. Uh, we've, we're 2,000 teachers short of where we need to be because our and our best and our brightest are now in Rogers, Arkansas, Fayetteville, mm -hmm. and Wichita, and Dallas. Um, so we have to make investments in our core functions. Um, and most of us should be able to agree that we need to be investing in education and in public safety and in infrastructure uh, and keeping our word to our veterans that we're not going to cut their, their uh, there, our investment there. And yes, David, on mental health, we need to be making investments there. Indian cultural museums. <laughs> pop museum. Pop, pop, pop museum. Pop museum. Yep. <laughs> we'll get to it. We'll get to it. Uh, but we can have we can have disagreements on a lot of different things. But at the core, uh, the core of where we should be, um, the core of where we should be is making life better for the next generation. We'll disagree on it, but I think that we can get together. I think we can rebuild that wall. I think we can rebuild Oklahoma. And I think that someday, um, and hopefully someday soon, uh, we will have to be busy in our kids and grandkids with all of our vacation days. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you talk about your association with the, with the Republican Platform Caucus? Sure, I've got a lot of friends in the Republican Platform Caucus. I have a lot of friends that voted differently than I did on everything <laughs> I just talked about, too. Right. Um, but uh, I would say John, John Eccles and I have been friends for before either one of us were elected. We were on the opposite side about every one of those things. So it doesn't mean you can't be friends with people. It doesn't mean you can't get along. It doesn't mean you can't go to have, have dinner afterwards. Um, but I think Sean Roberts uh, is, is someone I'm extremely proud of uh, that does the right thing just about every chance he has, he has to do. Um, the importance of the platform committee and the association between the platform committee and the House Democratic Caucus uh, is the state, the state question 640. They have to get to 76 votes. And from our perspective, if they're going to, uh, anything that comes out of the House of Representatives, this House of Representatives, that raises taxes and fees is going to hurt my people. It's not going to go after the big guys. It's not going to go after the most wealthy industry in the world. It's going to go after the guy in American Airlines buying a pack of cigarettes. It's going to go after uh, other proposals were, I mean, raise taxes and fees on child care, raise taxes and fees on haircuts, raise taxes and fees on funerals for crying out loud, uh, and child care. That hurts my, that hurts my folks. 
and it hurts not just Democrats, and, but it hurts Republicans and Independents that are struggling to make ends meet. But you do know that so. Republicans, the people that are Republicans and follow the platform, are opposed to any you know tax increases. Yep. And so, and I'm not, I'll, I'll come out. I'm not opposed to all the tax increases, right. um, but I do think that needs to be there. It needs to be equitable. And I don't think we're in this mess because people aren't paying enough taxes for cigarettes. I don't think we're in this mess because people aren't paying the government more for child care or that people aren't paying more to the government when they buy a car. We're in this mess because of poor leadership and a decade of failed fiscal planning uh, that has <coughs> snowballed into where we're at right now. Yes, sir. You did make the point on Pat Campbell's radio show and you and Joe Lauren were there in, I think, late January. You said the state has all the money it needs. <coughs> we do. But yeah, so your position. It is still my position. Uh, we have all the money we need if we go after tax credits, if we go after uh, some of the exemptions that are there. But the state has refused to do that. Okay. And so literally two and a half billion dollars worth of tax credits and the only credit they went after was the wind industry. So you've got the government picking winners and losers, which sure as heck isn't a conservative principle. Um, if you, want to, if you want to do that, let's put wind and let's put oil and gas and let's put it all on the board, put them up and let's vote yes or no and go on down the road. And if we would do that, I think the votes are there um, to have all the revenue. Okay, so you wouldn't try to protect the Hollywood credit for making movies in Oklahoma? You, you if, we put them all, if we put them all on the board yeah. and allow us to do it, I think that myself and many other people would vote to eliminate many of those. Okay. But if the question is down, we're just picking one or two. Okay. That's a different. That's a different discussion. Yes, ma'am. Let's talk about education for a minute. A lot of us who've been studying school systems and things are pretty frustrated because there's a lot of money. Like uh, Tulsa Public Schools gets over five hundred million dollars a year, but when you look at the organization chart, they have like 32 pages of administrators before you ever hit the principal level. There's no question that they need and, to be, whether it's cost public or any other any public school other. system, needs to be good stewards of the taxpayer money. We have too many small school uh, <coughs> systems District. of less than 100 kids or something. We have a lot of waste in the education system. A lot of us feel that the education system gets plenty of money, they just use it very poorly. I'm not going to argue that there's not waste, fraud, and abuse, because there is. Um, How can we address you, that, though? If you eliminated every administrative position, it's less than 2% of the state budget. If, I mean, less than 2% of the money goes to education. Uh, does that mean that we don't need to eliminate some? No. I think you're right. I think that there's, there's well, waste there. And, and but, uh, go ahead. Yeah. But we are did last in the country in our investment in education. We are. It's a fact. And our investment in education. Uh, we're dead, per capita we're basis, just 52% right? of our appropriated yeah, budget that goes still, to education. Well, that's that? that's higher ed included. It's well, and that's part, that's part of their that's part of their constitutional problem yep. is the fact that we're <coughs> forced to give money to higher education, and then we can't even ask them how they spend it. Well, I think my um, one of my core tenets while I've been in office is I think people should lift themselves up by the front of bootstraps. Um, but I also know not everybody has boots. And so that's why we invest in education. That's why we invest in K-12 ed, specifically. Uh, in full disclosure, I was a teacher. Uh, but I think that is one of the most important things we can do is invest in uh, pre-K and invest in K-12. Uh, give people the tools they need to be successful, whether they choose to be successful or not. That's on this. So, 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 so Representative Proctor, I mean, I, I read your bio and being a teacher, uh, you know, I'm just a business guy. And my kids play baseball, a lot of baseball, so we travel a lot of schools. We were a lot of high schools over in Oklahoma City this past weekend. And I was walking into one particular school, and but you know, a lot of new buildings. We have that in Tulsa as well. You can drive by Edison, we have a nice new library. And when you drive by there, you look at that, we got a nice new library with no teachers, no librarians in it. And as a teacher, that's gotta really just kind of piss you off. It does, and the, the people's <laughs> hands are people's hands are tied. Uh, the but, district's hands are tied in how they spend that money. Some some of it they can only spend on buildings. But, but listen, so. if, if if you ever watch Star Trek, or Star, or, uh, yeah, Star Trek, the Kobayashi Maru, you know, if you play the game and you can't win, you change the rules. It seems like there ought to be a change in the rules of how the income is spent because we got to add valorium, make it only go on assets, can't go to anything operationally. And if you're a teacher, you got to be saying, listen, we're fighting over. 
the small stuff. We need to fix the way the income comes in. And quit building buildings that, that we that we built for four thousand kids that got two thousand in it now and we're adding stuff to it. I think that we our state of the state of Oklahoma from a, from a business owner's perspective, economic development wise, uh, it's very hard to recruit businesses when you're near did last in the country in our investment in education. So if you were able to uh, retain teachers, make sure our best and brightest aren't going to Dallas and aren't going to Springfield and aren't going to Fayetteville or Wichita uh, and utilize some of those funds that are going to buildings that may maybe aren't currently needed and put that into the other areas. But, but, but you should know that, I mean, nationally, there's no correlation really about dollars spent in education and the quality of the education, which I is where voucher schools are coming into the I would, I would not agree. That's but, statistics. But, but but totally, I mean, we talk, we love to talk about Texas being, you just referenced Texas a minute ago, Texas has no state income tax, but they have twice as high property tax because they're able to redistribute property tax and use it for some operational monies. But they here, also have gross production tax and state now. You're, you're right, you're right on that as well. But <coughs> fixing how our income is spent, and I know there's a lot of people who want to protect that valorium, but when I get my tax bill, which I look at that and I see how much money is going to education and then I flip on the TV and everybody's leaving Oklahoma because of education. It goes back to Rhonda's comments. You know, we're taking ad valorem, we're spending on buildings, we're taking the state budget, spending 52%, most of it off the top, uh, to, to fund education, but we're woefully low. We have a pension issue as well that, you know, everyone wants to compare apples and oranges. It just seems we got to start and reset this because right now it's a political football and nobody's winning. Everybody's losing. The Democrats are losing. The Republicans are losing. The teachers are losing. The people who are paying the sales tax on the, the property tax are losing. The, the money that's going to the to Oklahoma City is those folks are losing. Everybody's losing. So there are no winners in this. And so it seems to me you know, we talk about everybody getting together and figuring it out. Maybe everybody ought to go have a, you know, a cocktail or something and figure you know figure it on a napkin or something. Re, refix you know fix this thing. Well, I mean, you, you would have a cocktail. We'd have you know Bud Light. But you know, no, so, no. <laughs> What you said on being able to being able to use the funds more wisely yeah. is going rather than building the buildings and put that into a, a, investing in our teachers, well, I, think, I, think, I think is a great idea. But that's support. constitutional. We have to change our constitution. It would take a constitutional change. So I think if it was put on the ballot, I think the people would support that. Are you are you in favor of a state of, of looking at the state constitution and, and redoing it the way we're supposed to do? Or at least we're supposed to go back and look at it every 20 years. And that hasn't happened since, what, 1974? Well, I think we have. We're very fortunate in Oklahoma to have a, the protection of having the initiative petition. And I think uh, when enough, when people get together and want to see a change, I think that's to me that's that's a if the legislature won't act, that's the proper way to do it. And we've seen that people will do that on any, on many issues, whether it's medical marijuana or it's anything. Well, the extreme so. example of what you're talking about is James Public Schools, where we have now an Olympic size swimming pool, two of them, two of them, and we have a planetarium. I think in and of, in and of themselves, stuff. those aren't bad things, but when you have teachers that are leaving the state, I mean, it seems like our priority of investment is not right. really supposed to be. The school board can fix that. The well, school they, board determines how much the teachers make. You guys only determine what the base how some of the, How the some of the money is spent is their hands are tied. I'm sorry? Do we raise no, hands? You just speak out. Oh, you <laughs> could. <laughs> All right. Maybe the loudest board maybe, can. maybe we've got some uh, areas here for... Uh, working some things out. Uh, first of all, is there some formula that's set in the Constitution that says for every $2 that goes into common ed, a dollar has to go into higher ed? I don't believe so. I haven't seen anything. Rod has heard some things. Uh, I could it's not. there, I don't know. But. Okay. So, <clears throat> right now, matter. we just give this basically rounded to about a billion dollars, about one-sixth of our appropriated budget over to higher ed and we just basically with blindfolds on that's this you know fat cat committee is going to distribute it how they want and they keep part of it for their high salaries what if we had something that was more like a pell grant that the government does that means tested so that the family of very very modest means has some help but we allow the universities to operate in the marketplace because we got over a hundred of them. It's not like I we're would, I would need to see the entire proposal, but that's something that I would not have a closed mind to. 
for sure. Okay, right. And boy, you're good at that. You couch your, your commitments very well. You've been around. Well, well. I've, I've learned when you vote on hundreds and hundreds of bills every year. Um, you got to read the fine print. Well, A, you got to read them, and B, they change. Right. Well, I, exactly. I, I, I had a proposal. I met you in the back of the lobby, and I said, would you support this on mental health? And you said, if it's a clean bill, I will. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but, yeah, that's the kind of thing I'm looking for, because right now, you know, it's more the wealthy families going to OU than the poverty families. But yet, our sales tax keeps growing, and that takes equally from the poor to help subsidize and make it so more would, the wealthy families. I would, I would argue that it takes disproportionately from the middle income families and the poor. Right, okay, yeah, based on their means, right. But my point is, uh, you know, by giving this money at the top so that we can drop the price of universities down to less than half what the market rate is, if you go to ORU or you went to TU, you know how much I can get. TCC. Oh, TCC, okay, I'm sorry, I thought you went to Oh, no. it's a TCC and SU that OU. Oh, that's right. Your friend uh, Jared, Mon Monroe. Jared went to TU. Mon Monroe Nichols went to TU. Yeah, okay. But my, my point being this. Okay. He's my, letting you know he's humble, okay? Yeah. Okay. Monroe and I look very similar, so. Okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. okay. <laughs> but my, my point being this is by giving that money to the university so they can drop the price for everybody less than half on the backs of the middle in class and poor <clears throat> by and large, we're give, taking from the poor and moderate means to give it to the wealthy families in the form of a half price, top notch education. I don't, I don't disagree. And I would say that I think, and some of you may disagree with this, but I think the system we have in Tulsa County, uh, where part of our property tax goes to the Tulsa Community College and allows people to get those boots that I was talking about, I think is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. And it's also a wonderful thing for economic development. Uh, when it's a great tool in the Ch Tulsa Chamber of Commerce, the regional chamber's pocket to be able to go to a company in Chicago, uh, like we just did, and got them to come to Tulsa over at Cityplex Towers, uh, rather than going to Chicago, was that, was a, the core piece of that was the TCC being able to get your tuition covered uh, and be able to give people an opportunity to get that education. Um, so anything that does that, I'm going to not close my mind to it and not say no without finding more about it. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Do you have any ideas about how we can actually achieve accountability and transparency for the monies that higher education receives? Do you have any ideas? I think the best, the best thing that you can do is do what David was talking about on social media last night, is finding uh, a series or a slate of people that you agree with to run for the legislature that have that as a top priority. Because until we do that, we're talking up here about uh, policy ideas. So but it's not a practicality until you have more people, like we were just talking about, elected, it's not going to happen. Because when what I saw happen in the last few weeks of session was special interest groups, big, powerful special interest groups that brought in lobbyists from all over the country, start putting fingers in legislators' chest and said, we're going to do A, B, and C, and you're going to like it. Until you have people that have a backbone to stand up and say no. We had a um, we had a Republican legislator from Western Oklahoma that said, "Courage is taking hard votes to raise taxes." Um, oh my goodness! Uh, See, nobody wants to name names. I was fortunate. Name. <laughs> <laughs> I was, everybody was that right. I was fortunate to be able to I was fortunate to be able to follow him and debate one or two people later. Later, and what I said was, "It doesn't take courage to raise taxes on a single mom trying to buy a car." It doesn't take courage to tax that guy at American Airlines who wants to buy his cigarettes when he gets off work. It doesn't take courage to block this, uh, to block extra benefits with standard deduction. It doesn't take courage to put extra taxes on people that buy a high rate car. What does take courage is standing up to powerful special interest groups mm -hmm. and telling them no. Mm -hmm. and that's why. Right. One thing that you saw, and it may have been for different reasons, but members of the Republican Platform Caucus and House Democrats did exactly that. We stood together and we said, no, that's not how we want, we want this thing fixed. And thank God that they did. Okay, I wish Republicans had done that. Right. Well, said, no, we should be listening to those. But here's, here's what I'm going to ask, because I know that over the past, because we've watched it over the past few years as the Republicans take more and more offices in the House and the Senate, having super majorities in both, in both of them. Um, 
that Democrat bills are not being heard for the most part. So what kind of deals were cut to try to get you guys to switch and vote for these tax increases? What kind of deals were cut with the, with the Democratic caucus well, by the, all, by the governor's office and leadership? There were there were no deals that ever came together. <laughs> so, but the uh, what we what we really wanted to have happen was the for oil and gas the the gross production tax to be restored uh, to what it was to where we're at least on close to the same level as Texas and North Dakota. Where by the way they're hiring like crazy and drilling like crazy right now, and paying two and three times what oil and gas companies are paying in Oklahoma. Um, and I'm not a big tax the wealthy guy. I'm not. I just think that they should pay what I'm paying. I pay 5%. You pay 5%. I think Harold Hand, when he gets some butter barrel oil out of the ground, that his effective tax rate on it should be the same that you and I pay. I think yeah. that's fair. I think that's equitable. I don't think it should be 17%, but it darn sure should be 5%. Okay. And uh, that's why I'm at it. Okay, he's got another question, and I've got some more. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, you need to, every Republican that didn't, how you, didn't vote how you wanted needs to be stamped right here. Oh, no. Listen, we've already started on them. I'm willing to do it. Oh, no. Eric, no, let me tell you something. We've we've already started on them. They they need to be here. They need to be held accountable. I don't think we have it. But we need that name of that one. Everybody's like, well, I don't want to name names. And it's like, but we need the names. In all honesty, Mr. Proctor, we spend a whole lot more time chewing on Oh, I know you do. I mean, we are tough, okay? Um, and we, that's why people run for the spots that I'm in, is to, is to take the questions and be able to defend them and be able to be accountable. Well, and not enough of that happens. Let's be honest here. Most, most Oklahomans, if you ask them their political beliefs, it runs a spectrum uh, from slightly left of center to slightly right of center. Most people are kind of in the middle, okay? They're not ideologues on the far left, and they're not ideologues on the far right, although some people think we are. But really, most of us are kind of more centrist. And so it's very frustrating when we watch on the national level or the state level where there's this constant griping and gritching at each other for extreme positions that nobody really cares about and nothing gets done. I mean, that's just the way it is. But let's talk about business, too, because we need to have a business-friendly state. And uh, I read a recent study, and it said the states that are doing the best have low state taxes that are consistent. In other words, they're not fluctuating them constantly. And from my perspective, I want all business people to be treated <coughs> about the same. I mean, fairly the same. Uh, I shouldn't, I have never seen a really successful deal from a city standpoint or state standpoint where we go in and we give, give away everything to lure a company in. And yeah, we, they come and then the minute the goodies are done, they're out of here, okay? Uh, we have to stop picking winners and losers. We have to have a consistent, low playing field of taxes and regulations that can be understood and complied with, you know, we have to be business. I don't disagree that we, I definitely agree we need to be business friendly, and I agree that taxes are a part of it. But if you talk to, if you talk to any company, my, my other job, I do commercial lending. So I analyze, I analyze loan requests from just about every industry you can think of on a major basis. Um, the, a lot of people talk about we need to run government like a business, and I agree. That any business I'm going to give a loan to, you know what they do? They invest in themselves. They, if they came to me for a loan and they said, I haven't, I haven't built a new playground or I haven't built, built new kitchen equipment in the last 15 years, I haven't reinvested in myself at all, and I've taken all of my profits and I've went to Disney World every other week, <laughs> probably not getting a loan from me, right? Good. So uh, I do agree that taxes are a part of that. But investing in education, investing in mental health, investing in public safety, uh, honoring commitments that we've made, well, keeping the road to yep. too. Yep. Investing. <laughs> We've had it. When I got elected in 2006, we had a $10 billion backlog in efficient roads and bridges. I've been on the transportation committee for all 11 years I've been there. We now have an $11 billion backlog in efficient roads and bridges. <laughs> um, 
And so we have, we are investing, we are fixing roads and bridges, but we're not keeping up because we do not have, um, because of what David and I just talked about, is that the failure to, whether it's revenue or whether it's tax credits or what, there is no political legislative will to address those at all. And so we do need to have a good business plan. But if I'm a business in Chicago or Dallas or Denver, and I want to relocate, relocate to Oklahoma, but I'm seeing that every positive teacher of the year in the state for every school that there is, is leaving, it seems like. Uh, and you've got rural hospitals, 12 of them now that have declared bankruptcy. Uh, you're darn sure not moving there. And so I think it's not, it's not one item. It's a puzzle of multiple pieces that we have to be able to, <clears throat> to make sure that we're making investments in. And we can argue one way or the other how you get the revenue to do that. Um, I would think that the easier way to do it is to address a lot of the tax credits, that many of which are icing on top of icing, uh, icing on top of icing to many companies, which is what David Broombaugh fought against every day except there. Uh, and I agree with him. Uh, but you're, right, you're absolutely right. That's how you ultimately grow the economy, is by having more jobs, and by having more businesses come here. And I just, and firmly, I just firmly believe, I, mean, it's yeah. I firmly believe you have to invest in core functions of government in order to get there. Okay, the last weekend, before we went into the last five days of session, I think you and a couple of other people went to California, uh -huh. right? And so that kind of halted the, the budget process. Is that correct? No, or, that's not correct. And and why did you go to California, and what I mean, what was the purpose? Well, first of all, I've been in office for 11 years. We've been in session on one Saturday, two Saturdays now. Um, so a trip that we planned months before. Right. And the I had visited with the floor leader specifically face to face, and I said, "Are there going to be votes on Friday and Saturday?" I was told no, and so I went. Um, should the uh, we I think we had seven votes on that Saturday, so we spent sixty thousand dollars of tax money to be in session on Friday and Saturday to pass bills that could have been passed Monday through Thursday, and so I think I missed seven legislative days in eleven years. Five of those were for Oklahoma on flights, and two of them were that weekend. Okay, so. What was the meeting that you went to? It was a national national popular vote conference uh, in San Francisco. That's a big no. So, well, <laughs> no. I'm not being, I will. I think I'm proving today that I'm willing to listen to anybody, and I'm willing to go listen and hear ideas, because I don't have a closed mind. Right. I'm willing to. Uh, do I agree with it, or do I agree with everything that's said here today? Maybe not. Right. But I'm as an educator, I'm going to go learn everything I can about every issue there is. I think that's one of your one of your biggest responsibilities as an elected official right. is to not just go talk with people that you agree with. We so, talk about the national popular vote. So, well, I'm happy to sit down with you and, and, and hear, hear your all side right. on it too, just as I was happy to visit with their side. Right. No, I, I understand and, uh, and I appreciate that. Now I'm going to ask you a question that it's, a, it's something I've heard. Um, I mean, I'm hearing that the Democratic Party is asking Scott Inman to not run as governor, but to run for lieutenant governor. You know I'm sure there's a lot of people in the Edmondson camp that would really like that. <laughs> <laughs> so who are, you, who are you leaning towards on that one? I'm supporting Scott Inman, 110%. You? And Scott Inman is, um, Scott Inman, Inman's been in my home, just like Shelly and David, Scott's held my kids. Um, I would, if, if something happened to me, I would have no problem with Scott Inman taking care of my kids. I believe any. I don't. We don't agree on everything. Absolutely not. I don't agree with every, every any, anybody on everything. And that's my wife. Um, but um, I believe that uh, if you were to look at how Todd Lamb voted and how this group would look at how Scott Inman had voted on everything we're talking about today, you would be with Scott Inman, without a doubt. And I think um, I don't. I think that Mr. Edmondson is a, is a bad man. I, I count him as a friend, uh, but I think that he has a very different vision than Scott Inman has, without a doubt. Okay. Yes, sir. Let's talk a little more about uh, what uh, Inman was able to do. 
your uh, your group of Democrats are lock solid. There was no peeling off a vote or two. Tell us the secret to that. Well, the secret is exactly what I talked about when I got here, uh, started talking to David, is for us, many of the issues that we were all together on were principled issues. It's not politics. You can get somebody off a political issue. You can get somebody from 7% on gross production tax to 5%. You can get somebody on uh, where, where and how you invest transportation money a different way. You can't change a, uh, you're not going to change a conservative Republican's mind on abortion. You're not going to make them pro-choice when they're pro-life. You're not going to make a Democrat raise taxes on middle-income families because we gave the most wealthy industry in the world a tax cut. And so for us, it was very easy to be together because it's who we are. That's our principles. That's the way we are set in stone. Most Republicans are together on, on the pro-life issue and many other issues. Um, and Democrats are together on that. So it's you can't peel off somebody from a core tenet of who they are very easily. Okay, okay can I follow so, up on that? Um, pro-life. Um, uh, you know, we see the National Democrat Party, it's almost like that's a sacrament is you just have to be pro-abortion, you know. Where would you and your colleagues be on this? Could you give us... Well, I can't speak to every every one of the 26, <coughs> right. but I know for, for Leader and Inman and I have a very strong uh, record of supporting life. Um, you can look at the record for the last 10 years, and it's out there as public record. Um, okay. My position is, am I pro-life? Yes. Do I have a record to back that up? Yes. Have I received awards from the Americans for life? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but for me, what I want is I want there to be less abortions in America. And I believe how you get there, I don't think we're going to get there policy-wise. I don't. I, think, I don't think it's going to happen. Um, I can tell you've got five people on that wear black robes in Washington, D.C. that make that decision, we're not going to get there. But what we should be able to agree on is creating a, an economic system, creating an environment where that is the last choice. When, when in the most wealthy country in the world, there's not a woman in this country that should have to choose between bankruptcy and having a kid. There's no okay. reason for that. I don't and, think that's yeah. the decision. I think oh, right I now you've got the state paying I, for the majority. I don't think it's everybody's decision. I don't think it's everybody's decision, but when you got somebody who's working minimum wage at 17 and gets pregnant and they get one, when, when my wife and I had our twins, uh -huh. $40,000 hospital bill. Okay. Yeah, can, yeah. can I follow up on that? But here's the deal, because we hear the same thing on crime issues, that it's because of economics that drives people to crime. Well, if that were true, the Great Depression would have been the, one of the greatest crime eras in our history. And some of us just don't buy that line that people become bad because they're poor. I don't believe that either. And I do believe that a lot of people choose to not be bankrupt. I don't I just disagree with that because the state is going to pick up the tab that is not that is the state pays for the majority of the births that are that are that occur in the right now um, yeah, I think it's a choice I know of the of, of births we're that, talking about abortion right but but I what do, I'm I saying, he says that it's a choice between bankruptcy and birth not for everybody but I do think it's an economic decision that many many people make if you've already got two kids I think having a third it's a kid is an, well, for some, yes, but I think it's also I think it's also an economic choice. And I think if we had a, I think what you see is in times when America has an expanding middle class, and the times when uh, people have expanded opportunities and people have more access to the American dream, the darndest thing happens. Yeah, you know, your abortion rate goes down. Eric, yours are our crux, in, and this comes to more of a national narrative. Is you hear a lot of people, especially using race issues and minority leaders that keep tying their policies of more socialism as somehow the only way we can be racially just. And some of us just don't buy it. You know, when we say, well, we're too hard on, you know, the black folks are economically depressed and that's why they do this and why, you know, I, just, you know, I, just, I firmly believe, we can disagree, but I, I firmly believe when you have policies that lead to a stronger middle class, when you have stronger economic opportunities, and when you have higher education that's more affordable, and when people have hope, um, they're less likely to make those decisions. Yeah, but I, I see wealthy people. I mean, take Rick Brinkley. You know, why did he steal over a million dollars? 
Was he really economically driven to it, or was it a moral bankruptcy? Was it a problem of you know his own addictions and his? I just I, I just don't see it's because we denied him the economic. Not, not on not on every individual case. I don't disagree with that, but I do think that a lot of the a lot of the ills and a lot of the things that many of us would agree that are moral in this country would be would be less so if we had a charter of place. In the 2010, 2010 census, for the first time in U.S. history, the middle class is less than 50% of the population. So the middle class is definitely shrinking. Okay? And this is troubling to me. It's troubling to me, and this is a national issue, not a state issue. So when you see Last week, Lowe's laid off 125 IT workers of similar jobs to India. We see the use of H-1B visas, H-2B visas, and all these other crazy visas. And now this OPT program, which came out on Breitbart yesterday, where big national companies are hiring foreign citizen U.S. graduates and half of the jobs are going to them every year because they don't have to pay Social Security and, and companies, Medicare taxes. And those companies are getting tax credits. Yes. Well, they, they, we, we are discriminating against our own workers because of our tax burdens and all this. We have to change that. I don't disagree. And I offered, I offered a bill a few years ago that said any company in Oklahoma that's outsourced jobs out of the state or out of the country I think it was out of the country. If they're on the Department of Labor's list for outsourcing jobs, you don't get a tax credit anymore. You got to pay it back. Good. Yeah. But it wasn't allowed enough. See, I know, and that's listen. That's part of our frustration. That's where we have the money we need. But okay, I got to jump in on this one. How many times have you reauthored that since? At least once. You to put it back since, but it's been several years. Why was that not a perpetual it was, renewal? It was distorted. Well, I can tell you what died. Uh, we, we all, in the house, the Senate you can offer as many bills as you want. In the House, we're limited to eight. And so, when when the idea gets shot down over and over again, you can continue to put it forward, but I only get eight bills a year. So that's that's part of it. That. Um, the I still support it. And I think it needs to happen. Uh, a lot of my bills become law a year later with Republican names on them, <laughs> so, which is fine with me. I mean, that works. That's great. Um, I'll give you an example. I, I filed uh, I, I filed legislation um, that, that benefits veterans, which is a big issue for me. I was raised from the time I was four until I went to college with my grandfather, who served with General Patton in North Africa, Sicily, and Italy. Um, and he and my grandma raised me from the time I was four until I went off. And, uh, I was very much involved in the Oklahoma Water Flash Program and headed it up for the eastern side of the state. So it's an issue that's really important to me. And so I've authored many, many bills uh, that were benefit veterans, and some of them get authored by Republicans and then become law. That's great. From my perspective, wonderful. Um, but I do think there's something to be said, and we touched on this a little bit ago. When you have super majorities of one party in both houses and a governor from the same party, it's not good for the state. And whether it's not good if that was the Democrats in Oklahoma or it's not good if it was the Democrats in Washington, D.C. You need more. Our, our founding fathers put into our republic checks and balances for a reason. And the more checks and the more balances we have are a positive thing. And so do I think that we need to have more conservative Republicans elected? Yes. Do I think we need to have more Democrats elected? Yes. Because what we have now is not working. Well, I, would, I would say this to Tulsa 912 is a nonpartisan group. I mean, we do lean conservative. But if we know you have a bill that we that we believe in, we will yeah. fight for your bill. Mm -hmm. But you have to let us know, because there's no way we're going to read 2,000. I've got, Rhonda can get a hold of me very easily. And, uh, I've got and especially the bills so. having to do with uh, corrupt practices, or, or and we really don't like favors. Well, well, the, the, ironic thing is, the ironic thing is, when, when Democrats had control for 90 years, you saw the exact same things that are happening right Thank now. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> and, uh, and then maybe benefiting different people. Yeah. But you saw the same things happening right now. 
Uh, I think we're trying to clean up June Stipe still, right? I think somewhere he's smiling about what happened this session. Yeah. <laughs> you did have a big success in February regarding how schools handle leftover food. Yes. That's, Talk about it. That was a bill I was able to get through uh, that said that right now we have literally millions of dollars worth of food that's just being thrown away uh, in school systems. And that's another issue. Thank you, David. I'm very passionate about. Is one out of every, at least one out of every five kids in Oklahoma go to bed hungry or have some type of food deficiency. Um, and well, I, can, I, can take you to, I can take you to 100 houses within two miles of my house where it's an issue. Yeah. Because I take them food. But Republicans supported you, didn't But there's also. Yes, they did. It was a bipartisan, unanimous vote. And what my bill said was rather than throwing that food away, that every school employee is now an agent of the food bank. If they know a child uh, that has uh, food deficiencies, they can keep that carton of milk or they can keep that banana and they can send it home with the kid. And it also eliminated liability for that teacher for that school kid. So that's an example of some things we, the one thing we did work together on that we were able to get through. Representative Dunning came out. That was extremely awesome. Let's answer this gentleman's question. Yes, sir. Hi, um, I'm the interloper. Uh, I'm a rare breed. Uh, we moved to Oklahoma from Richmond. This is our first meeting. This is my wife, Maria. My name is Ken. And I guess my question for you is, I very much agree with the perspective that uh, too strong single party dominance in a state allows for abuse. I mean, we've seen that over and over again early in the Bush administration. Uh, there was similar things at the, at the national level. Uh, I, I heard on a, a, a talk show that um, the national Democrats have moved so far left that it leaves lots of rooms for Republicans to move toward the center and moderate, even to, if you see the Senate uh, health bill, you, you, you certainly see that. So I guess my question to you is, in Virginia, you're a conservative Democrat, a uh, conservative Republican. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know how you get Democrats in Oklahoma that talk like you do. So explain to me how you reconcile having the views that you have with sure. the National Party. The, uh, I would argue that nationally many of the Republicans have went the other way. It creates opportunity for us. <laughs> That's also, and I want, I want to talk about why that is just real briefly. Uh, because of redistricting and gerrymandering, both on the legislative and the federal level, they are, seats are drawn in such a way that they will only be represented by a Democrat or they will only be represented by a Republican. So what that means is when you run in a primary, you have to be super conservative or you have to be super liberal to win that primary. And so when they get to DC or they get to Oklahoma City, there's nothing to agree on because they're so ideologically different. There's not very many moderates. So to me, redistricting reform done by people used to, I think maybe Will well, Rogers, somebody a lot smarter than me once said, that used to the voters pick the politicians, now the politicians pick the voters. And it's not a good way to, not a good way to run the government. Um, and so I support, I'm a firm supporter, and I think it would have to be done through an initiative petition of having an independent redistricting committee made up of citizens rather than politicians. Yes. And I think that that would be extremely positive. Uh, it would help Republicans, it would help Democrats in Oklahoma, it would help Republicans in California, it has, they have it there. Um, California's district lines are drawn by citizens, not drawn by politicians, which is why you still have Republican Congress in California. And I think that that's, uh, that's a positive thing to take politicians out of that system. How do I reconcile my views? Uh, just for example, like, like on the abortion issue, I'm pro line and that's why I'm a bit pro. Because I firmly believe that if you have an expanding middle class and you have access to health care, and people, more people have opportunities for American dream, that there will be there will be fewer abortions. I believe that's the core tenet of my faith. That's and that's why I'm that. Do I agree with everything with my party? Absolutely not. Actually, I felt this year that I was when I was sitting at the House of Representatives. It sure as heck felt a lot like Boston and Sacramento <laughs> when I was sitting there in Oklahoma City um, with some of the policies that were coming out. Um, I'm not a big party person, obviously, I'm here, uh, but we have to get to the point where we don't look at that R or that D. Because A, it creates, straight party voting creates lazy politicians and it creates lazy voters, frankly. Because uh, you don't have to research the candidate. And then you get Republicans like we have here uh, that don't necessarily agree with you. And that, are, that I would argue um, don't share very many 
tenants in their mind with your platform, or at least only what's convenient. You can't get them to read it. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we would have invested in pre and pre <laughs> 20 years ago, more legislators would be able to read today. Okay, obviously, this is a deep set belief of yours that I think you and I disagree with on. Back in the 80s, I used to do, I was trained to do sidewalk counseling, you know, in front of abortion clinics and stuff. Now, the best research we had, an abortion had only become legal for, you know, less than about 10 years earlier. But the primary uh, group of the demographic of people seeking abortion was mostly white, middle to upper income, and mostly college age to mid, you know, it's mostly the career track woman. And the abortion was seen as an inconvenience. Now, you're saying that it's economics driving abortion. I would also argue there, there's an entire generation of uh, minority children in America that are here today. That's right. Um, largely. And that's yeah, I, I, I'm, just, I'm just saying you're characterizing it as primarily the poor getting the abortions. No, I, I, don't, I don't believe that. I believe that it's, it is poor, but it's also many middle-income middle families that make that decision too. And I think the reason why is we had, we had a recession in the 80s. Uh, across the country, and that was able to be filled because uh, women were able to go get a job. They went and got a job, and they were able to supplement that income. Well, now both both husband and wife are working. They can only go get so many second and third jobs, and a big part of that is what we discussed with the jobs being overseas and wages not keeping up with inflation and the middle the middle class shrinking, and that has direct, severe economic impacts and social impacts. And we. You and I need to sit down and have a cup of coffee. Yeah, well, yeah, because because if, if, if all those socialist policies you're pushing through were true, then France wouldn't have any abortions because they got all the socialism in the world. Well, the only the only red I follow is where the, the, the red I follow mm -hmm. isn't red from Moscow. I follow red from what I, my tenets of works that come on the right hand side of the Bible. Uh, so we can argue about it one way or the other. You know, I can sit be a friend. Yeah. I'd love to sit down and talk with you and have a discussion uh, anytime you want. All right, so. Well, so, it's, uh, so much of it is cultural. The loss of religion, the loss of the family, the loss of, it has, that is, those aren't economic issues. Those are issues that are part of the culture. And I think that's something that has to be worked on, is the culture. Yeah, you're you're right. my father. What, what their regulation of Listen adoption to, is. Like the, the women's march, they, there were women saying they were going to go have an abortion just because they wanted to prove that they were, I, you know, this, 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 is, that's, this is crazy. That's, that's, in my opinion, that's immoral. That's yes, it, absolutely. I don't disagree at all. My father taught at Greeley Elementary in North Tulsa for 22 years, as far north on Cincinnati as you can go. Uh, the last year my father taught, there was only one student in his class who didn't have a parent who had either been incarcerated or was incarcerated. They were living with grandparents, aunts, and uncles. You're absolutely right. That is a core, a core issue that we need to do better on as a country. Um, but my position is, if we can expand the middle class and you have fewer abortions, that's a positive thing. And if, uh, if you want, to, we can expand the middle class for other reasons. And if that happens too, wonderful. So I think it should be something we should be able to come to consensus. We ought to be looking on the other side of the equation, and that's adoption. Yeah. When you think of how many people are going overseas to adopt, when, I, uh, and yet we have kids high abortion. You know what a great bill would be? We take all the, the tax credits that are given to the oil and gas industry right now, and they don't need to give it to families that are not. Because it's a heavily regulated. Give them a $20,000 tax bill yeah. for 10 years. Well, and, and get, DHS out, of the, get DHS out of the mix and, and their cycle battle stuff. Yeah, that, right. That, that makes it virtually impossible for, for good guys. families to adopt. My sister and brother in law just went through a battle with DHS adopting my niece, uh, who came from an absolute horrible, exactly what we were talking about situation. I wouldn't wish on anybody. And the uh, DHS made it extremely difficult, and there are reforms needed there, and I saw it firsthand. Well, by the same token, the reason that DHS does what it does is because of the laws that the legislature has passed. They are not doing things that are really out of bounds with the laws you guys passed. I don't disagree. And one, one of the things I'm most proud of is offering legislation with Representative Derby, former, not David, but Dale, uh, not Dale, but David Derby, about three years ago. Uh, to help improve the process, at least one that one particular part of the process where I where I saw, which is where if there's a felony involved, uh, 
child neglect and felonies that the parental rights are, are no longer intact. Uh, so I think there's a lot of room there that, and you're exactly right, it's perpetuated by not only what has been done, but what is not being done. Well, I'm standing here because Rhonda had to leave early, and uh, I want to thank Mr. Parker for his right. You know, we all have our own ideas. Even the Republicans don't agree <laughs> on a lot of things. So we're all Americans first, and we're all Americans uh, come and second. So we have to work together. We have to hear the other side. We have to figure out where we can, what the things that we can get together on and, and solve our problems. So I really appreciate Mr. Parker coming, and I appreciate all you guys. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks.